So today we're talking about learning sites. We are really wanting to have a session which um, brings in the experiential learning of the whole panel. We've got a very rich panel for you today, but we also hope that many of you sitting in the room will have insights to contribute. Um, so it's a reflection across the different contexts um, and reflection across projects which had slightly different aims but which were welcome, um, which were aiming to, um, and use different terminology in fact, but which were all I think sharing some goals and we'll, we'll unpack those a little bit. Um, so my name is Sophie Witter, I'm Professor of International Health Financing and Health Systems at Queen Margaret University. Um, and I'm the co-research director of Rebuild for Resilience. Um, and we're going to be talking about the Rebuild experience, but we're also, as I said, going to be talking across different projects and um, honoured to have a really fantastic group of people with us today. We're not very gender balanced in the room. <laughs> However, we have got Fernando online and I'm going to be putting him on the screen very shortly. Um, he is joining us to talk about experience from Guatemala, but he's currently studying in, in Europe. So, <clears throat> I'm going to start by introducing our panel. If I can make my screen move, there we go. So, representing um, the Rebuild experience today and talking about work from Nepal is Shopika, who is a public health researcher and she's been working to strengthen health systems in Nepal, both nationally and also at the sub-national region. We're also honored to have Jacinta Nzinga, who's a health systems policy researcher and social scientist from Kemri Wellcome Trust Institute in Nairobi. I'll explain a little bit about some of the projects they're on and then they're gonna be explaining a lot more about them shortly. We've also got my colleague Maria from the Vapor Project. So she is, was the Maternal Child, Youth and Adolescent Health and Nutrition Program lead at the Provincial Department of Health when we started our project. Um, and she's now working as an independent public health um, consultant, um, bringing her insights on the South African health system and particularly focused on health system utility and relevance. So online we have um, Fernando Jerez. And my Spanish is not quite good enough to read the long title of his institute, but they're called Stegs, Kegs and he's gonna explain much better about their, their work, but he's a social scientist with a human rights advocate with over 15 years of professional experience working with grassroots organizations on organizational learning and community-driven accountability um, action in public health. And finally, and last but not least, Joe Raven from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine Who's, who's going to be focusing on the Perform to Scale project today, although she is also a co-research director with me on Rebuild. Um, she is a health system researcher and social scientist um, and works on health systems, health workforce, health management and scale up um, with a particular focus on fragile and conflict affected states. So, <clears throat> Our objective today is to um, reflect across these very different contexts, as I said, projects which focus on different elements within the health system. So some of them had a health workforce um, focus, some of them were cross-cutting, some of them work more strongly on social accountability and grassroots organizations. Um, so very diverse goals and diverse contexts, but some shared approaches. Um, and we've called it learning site. The terminology, as I said, is, is actually varied across the projects. So I guess the first thing that's important to think about is what do we mean by learning sites? And, um, and actually is relatively little written about that, which is why I thought it was interesting to have the conversation today and maybe reflect on a possible um, learning product coming out of the discussion today. I, one of the elements which is, I think, clearly implied by a learning site is the length of the collaboration. <clears throat> so it's an engagement across um, a substantial period of time, and the reason for that is obviously to build relationships and build trust. The second component I think is important for learning sites in general, but again, I'm really happy if we get challenge and addition. 
um, is this idea of um, local action research, so knowledge for local use, so there's a very strong emphasis on, on the kind of practice component, but also on co-production, so co-production of knowledge, so recognizing that local lived experiences are very important, whether you're working with the community or you're working with health system actors or you're working with both, that there's a lot of experiential knowledge, there's a lot of tacit knowledge, there's a lot of knowledge and strong local relationships, which are all essential, not just for the research, but for the outputs and the uptake. A fourth component that I think is really important in many of these sites is an attempt to rebalance the power dynamics. So sometimes that's between the sort of international national team, but also with, between community and health system actors, um, and also between researchers and implementers. So I'd be very interested in the panel's views on some of these issues, and they're going to be talking to these points. A final element I think is really important is around embeddedness. So most learning sites are based on a very regular interaction. And the idea is that you come to understand the system constraints and also the system possibilities through being um, either part of or at least a very active um, observer within a system. So that all sounds really good. And a lot of these concepts have become, you know, almost kind of normative truisms that that's, that's what we aim to do and it's all wonderful. But we know it's not easy. I know actually there have been some very interesting sessions on this around participation and so on earlier today, bringing up some of the challenges. But there's certainly <coughs> challenges with learning sites as well and we'd like to understand more about them and also about how the different projects try to overcome them. So for example, and again, there's not a huge amount written about this, but one of them is around um, the challenge to rigor. So some writers have said this is all very observational, it lacks kind of scientific um, originality, and the researchers become very partial because they're, they're living in this context that they're writing about. So kind of can we trust, and are they writing, are they limited to messages that are acceptable to the partners they're working with? And I think there are some tensions to think about there. So the second question, I guess, is around power relationships. How effective and how easy is it for researchers to kind of work more politically, work within the system, understanding constraints, and also not to be an additional burden? Because we have to recognize that a lot of these learning sites potentially are also making demands on system actors who are quite thinly stretched already. I think that's an important issue to think about. Sustainability institutionalization, again, <laughs> Not easy questions, but definitely a challenge for learning sites because they aim to work longitudinally. They have these long-term um, emphasis and aspiration and, and recognition of the importance of relationship building. Then how do we sustain them? What kind of structures and funding and uh, other means are needed? And finally, the question of scale-up, I think, comes up as well. So you have these intensity of relationships. How do we, if they are working, and I, we want to hear today how well they're working, Assuming they are generating benefits, how do we bring that to a larger scale? So those are just some starting reflections from the panel. And then, as I said, the aim is to have a conversation. So the first, the way we're going to structure it is there's a first set of questions our panelists are going to talk to. We're then going to engage with them as a room. And then there's a second set. And the first set um, is just asking for a little bit of background. So, what was the learning site you were involved in? What was it aiming to do? What kind of challenges did you face working with different groups? And how did you navigate or, or resolve those? So that's our first set of questions. And then we will go to some that look a little bit more at the kind of outcomes and gains. Please in the question and answer, bring in your own reflection thoughts, because I can see in the room we have many people with a lot of experience. So, just very, um, yes, let's start with Shopika, would you mind? Just working very pragmatically from this end of the row. Um, let me check the mic's working. Your reflections. I'm going to try and get Fernando on the screen now. Can we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sophie. Uh, hello, everyone. 
Uh, before moving straight to the learning side, I would like to briefly um, uh, explain about what this Rebuild for Resilience Consortium is. So um, we are partners uh, from uh, Myanmar, <coughs> excuse me, Lebanon, Nepal, Sierra Leone, and the UK teams. And this uh, FCDO-funded uh, consortium, uh, in this consortium, we, aims, uh, we aim to um, uh, um, examine and strengthen the resilience capacity of health system and build a stronger system for health, <coughs> especially in the fragile and shock-prone setting. So, excuse me. <coughs> <laughs> And all the all these settings, these countries that uh, we we are in the consortium are um, the example of the uh, context that are facing um, the fragility. Uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, uh, and. Um, we are we are this you know, fragile and shock prone setting that are experiencing different forms of conflict, violence, um, pandemics, and other different types of shocks and stressors. Uh, so um, I would like to highlight more about the learning site in Nepal. So giving a um, brief flavor of the context in Nepal. So recently we have this um, uh, constitutional arrangement, and now we are in the federalized state. So we, uh, the unitary system uh, that existed previously is now replaced by the federalized system, and then we have the three tiers of government, the federal seven provinces and 753 governments. Yes, it's a small country, but we have 753 local governments, and each of the local governments, they are now responsible to uh, deliver basic health services uh, in addition to other different functions like um, de developing the plans, policies, uh, implementing public health programs. So this is quite a challenge for the local governments um, uh, in, in this uh, path uh, to uh, this transition to federalization. It is already evident that there is a capacity gap among the local governments. So uh, now um, uh, they are calling for support. Um, um, uh, in addition to uh, the, uh, this federalization itself has, um, has uh, come as a um, chronic stress to the local health system. And, uh, and on top of that, there are several other, um, other problems that has been existing in the local government since ages, like the chronic shortages of health workforce and um, um, uh, lack of uh, proper supply of drugs, medicines, and uh, poorly established infrastructures. So all those challenges are there since ages. And now the federalization, federalization and again, this COVID-19 pandemic has posed another trait. So Local government is now more uh, more struggling to deliver the uh, basic healthcare services as well as managing the emergency services. So in this context, we uh, we selected a municipality which uh, which is in Lumbini province, which is in the flat part of Nepal. And this uh, this this uh, municipality has additional vulnerabil vulnerability uh, because it uh, shares open borders with India, and that was other numbers of challenges. So um, so our learning site is a kind of unique maybe um, from other context. Uh, and in uh, through our learning site, we are uh, aiming to um, build a more resilient local health system by um, strengthening the capacity of local governments. Uh, and uh, we are doing it in a more participatory way. We are doing a participatory action research, uh, which goes in a circle of uh, different stages. We identify the problems. We work together with the municipality to identify the root causes and uh, solutions, and then act on the solutions. We support the municipality in implementing those solutions, and then we monitor, we evaluate, we reflect through our crit critical reflections meetings, and then uh, we, uh, again, we ad adapt and then move on to the next cycle. So uh, this is how we are implementing, and the unique uh, feature in case of Nepal is the embeddedness. We are embedded within the municipality, so we work together with the municipality. We share common space, so that is, in a way, <clears throat> allowing us to know the system more closely, like the uh, the nuances that occurs within the system, the power plays within the system, how stakeholders interact, what are not only the technical technical matters, but also the non-technical matters that is in a way helping uh, us to to create that kind of trust, uh, uh, trust and strong relationship between the research team and the municipality team, and in a way also facilitating us to uh, implement our research project in a more coordinated and more collaborative way. So I think, yeah, I, I'll stop. Any challenges to highlight? Um, uh, while we implemented this project, okay. Yes, I mean, um, 
um, we, we, in a way, we had the, that advantage because we have been working in this municipality since uh, since, since past few years. So um, that is, I think, that can also be taken as an advantage uh, when we work in such scenario where we uh, enter the municipality because. Um, going straight to the municipality where you, or the local government where you don't know, is kind of <coughs> a bit challenging, but uh, taking advantage of that position and, uh, um, in, in <coughs> excuse me, I'm very sorry. That's all right. Um, Should we relieve you? Yeah. Um, you can come back to that in your oh, maybe, maybe I should do that, I'm so sorry. No uh, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. So I'm going to talk about um, a learning site that we ran uh, during, when we were part of a consortia that uh, we wrapped up about four years ago now. So this was the RESIST Consortium, uh, Resilient and Responsive Health System. So as the consortium, we were doing a couple of pieces of work around um, human resources for health, health financing, but also governance. Uh, but for the particular learning sites, work, this was really a collaborative engagement between health researchers and health managers in three geographic learning sites. So one in one county in Kenya, in Kilifi, and then we had two sites in South Africa, um, in Joburg and, and uh, Cape Town. And the idea of this learning site was really to engage, to work together with the managers to learn a little bit more about the microprocesses of governance and how we can support them, particularly during the daily routines that they were going through. Now, this was in the context of very rapid devolution in Kenya, where ma uh, managers had now been given uh, leadership and manage management responsibilities without any proper uh, preparation. And then for South Africa, the context behind that was that there was some decentralization and administrative shifts. So we were really then working with the managers um, as they were going through that transition to help them navigate and provide them with the right capacities to lead and manage as they went along. Um, so from the word go, I think, um, and, I, and I think for, for maybe a bit different from everyone that's seated here, is we've had a little time to reflect because this is something that we set up some years back. Uh, but uh, from the one go, we were very key in terms of what our goals are, were as a, as a learning site. And we had three main goals, uh, to promote learning okay, within those learning sites and to do this together with the manager over a very uh, prolonged period of time, which then allowed the relationships to build more organically and f allowed us to then continue sh shaping those relationships towards the goals that we were looking for. And in that sense, a very participatory uh, approach to doing that. Um, then our second goal was identifying and doing together Okay, so identifying with the managers what are the main challenges that they are facing, what, the, what are also the, the apps that they are going through and what facilitates that. But um, I think quite uniquely thinking, when we were thinking about how we were doing, we were very, we sort of learned that part of doing together with the managers turned out to be an intervention in itself, yeah? So it helped, it, it provided a space where we could reflect together and that reflective practice was then very, it was like a catalyst for us thinking about, you know, what are some of the levers of change within the micro level, uh, because we were working with, with the county, uh, with the county team and hospital teams, but what are some of the levers of change that we can start uh, cultivating at that point that can also reflect to the, to the macro level. And then the third, specific goal around the learning site was also the place of reflection and feedback in this whole process. So we understood that again as a very deliberate action, an active process. So we weren't just giving feedback uh, in terms of providing um, results from the research that we were doing, but we were really working together with the, ma with the managers to understand that this information provides um, avenues for learning for all of us so this was information that uh, we gave through reflective practice, the way we presented it, we'd wait for the managers to think about what it means, um, uh, how can they use it back, what does it mean for us again as a, as a research team, and how can we use it again further in a sort of uh, cycles of learning and iterative, uh, iterative change. So for, um, I mean, and I will keep talking a little bit more about some of the 
of the of the, of the of the structures that help us work really well. But um, just two main ones to point out is that when we think about when we thought about the learning sites, we had the geographical advantage as well. We were physically embedded within that setting. So as a research program, Kemri Welcome Trust operates in two main hubs in Kenya, one in Nairobi and one in Kilifi. And within Kilifi, uh, we've worked with these managers and other healthcare workers and the communities over many years. So I, I think just having those relationships and using them to then um, take things forward was very useful. How many years of learning sites? So we've, for about eight years, and although the project has ended, we continue using the learning sites. We never really saw it as a project, but really as a learning platform. And we continue using the learning sites for a lot of other research that we continue doing as a program. Um, so for us, it's, it's really not a project that came to an end, but it's something that actively remains and helps us um, do the work that we do. Thank you very much, Jacinta. So interestingly, also not talking about challenges yet, but going straight to the gains from the project. <laughs> we'll loop around on that one. Um, yeah, on to you, Joe. Okay. Thanks very much, and hello to everyone. Good afternoon, and I hope you're not too tired so that you can really focus on our, our session today. So I'm just going to be talking about Perform to Scale, uh, which is a program with, that was funded by the European Commission, um, ended earlier this year, and it was a five-year program. And it, we worked in developing learning sites, really, in action research in Ghana, Malawi, and Uganda. And the program focused on strengthening management at the district level to address workforce performance and service delivery challenges. And the sort of core concepts underneath that were that we'd selected decentralized set, um, settings where we thought that the district level would have some um, more space for making decisions and acting upon them. And also that, that district um, management teams, they know their situation. They understand it very well. They know the problems that they face there and that this program was trying to create the space for them to reflect and learn about that and address problems that they were facing, learn from each other, and strengthen their health system, really. So it was kind of that tacit knowledge that was we were really trying to tap into. So what we did was we established these learning sites, which were groups of three districts, district health management teams that were neighboring districts. And the management strengthening intervention was a participatory action research approach to enable the district health management teams to analyze the problems that they wanted to, um, which were related to service delivery and largely um, health workforce performance as well. Develop work plans and implement those over a period of time. And through that, learn about how to manage, you know, strengthening their management, learning about how to do that better and better. Um, so these, this intervention was really uh, facilitated by country research teams. So there were country research teams in Uganda, Ghana, and Malawi. And it was done through short workshops, joint meetings of district health management teams, and lots of follow-up support visits, emails, telephones, WhatsApps, whatever way that we could communicate in the best possible way. And these cycles took about 10 months and they, uh, and then moved it, so 10 months and then moved into another cycle, either continuing with the same problem or identifying another one that they wanted to address. So that's kind of the background to it. Challenges? quite a lot, <laughs> and I'm just going to focus on a few here. Uh, and the first one, I think, is that um, one of the principles was that we weren't going to provide any sort of extra implementation funds. So those work plans, we didn't give any money for those work plans. Um, and this, um, it was quite challenging that at the start of the project and it kept rearing up throughout the program 
But we did a lot of talking about that within the consortium. How do we manage that? Because people, we have to manage people's expectations, the DHMTs and other stakeholders. So we talked about how we would do that, and we did it through talking openly about it. Right from the word go, we started saying, we are not going to provide more implementation funds. Um, what we're going to do is help you look for where to tap into, where to put these actions that you've identified that you want to do into your district implementation plan or where the donors are coming with some additional money, how you can sort of maneuver into that space. So we did a lot of that, a lot of maneuvering. Um, and I'll talk about the gain of that in the next bit because there is a sort of a positive side to that. Um, then a second one, sorry, I'm dropping on my paper, um, is that um, another challenge was documenting this complex process. I think it's really hard. Um, and, you know, we used lots, of, tried to use lots of different methods. And with the district health management teams, we tried to use reflective diaries. They went down like a lead balloon, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they, they weren't really... What, what they did do, though, was that some of them documented their actions. And then when the, the research teams and the local officials went to talk with them about reflection and observation, they used those as a tool to discuss stuff. So they did work in some ways, but not quite in the, in the strongest way possible. So, so we had a lot of challenges with that, but we talked about that a lot again and had those inter-district meetings where they, there was really strong reflections in those about actions, what we could do better, uh, what worked, what worked, what didn't work well, how to move on with those actions. Um, uh, the other thing was that we, um, we focused the program on district health management team and realized that we needed to bring in other local stakeholders and bring them in quite quickly because these decisions, some of these decisions to, to address problems needed to be by the local council, or the chief administrator officer, the health workforce managers. So we brought those into the, the, the whole cycle, which was good, but it also brought a whole set of challenges about power and hierarchy that we needed to really think through and how to manage that. Um, and that brings me on to my last one, was about the whole facilitation of an action research program. And these are, facilitating is a really challenging set of skills, I think. And as researchers, maybe um, a reflection on our, us is that, you know, we're, we're maybe not the best at that. And we, <laughs> you know, <laughs> We're used to doing stuff, aren't we? And, 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 and this, is, this is, requires a whole load of other sets, sets of skills. Um, so it, it took time to adopt that. We did a lot of talking through that, a lot of training amongst ourselves, uh, consortium workshops, to try and establish that, and a lot of reflection about it, of what worked and what didn't work, and how we could do that better. But I'm sure I'll be able to elaborate on that more later. Anyway, I'll shut up. Thank you, Joe. That's really great. I mean, I think a number of those challenges are going to be reflected in other people's experiences. Um, so I think we will come back to that. And I think if we have time, we can talk about some of them, including, yeah, the power and hierarchy is a constant challenge and working out who the stakeholders are. And then, of course, as you say, the keeping on top of the data, because this data is not like, it's not structured conventional research data. It's, it's, it's a whole continuous set of relationships and context changes that are happening and at what points you yeah what do you note but also at what point do you formulate that and, and and how I think there's quite a lot to discuss there and certainly expectation management I think is a very common one as well so Maria over to you vapor and challenges and some of them may be linked or separate Thank you very much. So VAPOR project, uh, verbal autopsy with participatory action research. So that may sound somewhat contradictory in one sentence. Um, so I'll try to clarify how we combine. Um, we are based in Pumalanga province. It's a province of about 5 million uh, 
population in the northeastern part of South Africa. Uh, we are based at the WITS, um, University of the Witwatersrand MRC agent called Health and Social Demographic Surveillance Site. So that's quite a unique setting. It's one of the oldest surveillance sites um, on the, the continent, um, just turned 30. So that is quite a, a rich history of um, research and data available at the site. So it is located in a so-called former homeland of South Africa from the apartheid legacy where um, it was a homeland and um, rural area, but uh, to reflect it's a rapidly transitioning rural area. And I think a couple of years from now, we may need to rethink our terminology. Um, if you can now order takeaway pizza and it gets delivered with a scooter, we're not sure if it's rural anymore. <laughs> so it's quite a, a unique setting. Um, so we uh, work to connect the service users, in other words, our communities with the service provider, which is the health system, through a process, uh, a series, again, of iterative cycles mm -hmm. of um, reflection and learning. And um, we... It was supposed to be a five-year project, so we're coming up to seven years and moving towards an end. So we had some costed and no-costed ex um, extensions with COVID, etc. And after our first cycle, um, we had um, an evaluation um, internal, and along with that, with our health system stakeholder partners, we came to a reciprocal agreement whereby... <laughs> A more direct involvement of some of the health system stakeholders within our process, as well as inviting our researchers into structures of the health system, for example, district health management meetings. Um, so that immediately brought a, a embedding, which was planned and hoped for, but quite explicit early on in the project. Then COVID happened and we had to... Um, redesign and rethink and we did some work around identifying um, the responses in the community and from there uh, again with um, consultation with the health system as well as our communities the focus then shifted to community health workers as the direct link between our communities and our health system so we have then um, in our third and our final cycle worked quite directly with our community stakeholders our community health workers and the health system um, so that has taken the shape of a, a training program that we've developed for community health workers where they are um, trained on using participatory methods for community mobilization and community engagement. And maybe I'll share a bit of that on, on the learning side. So um, bringing, using participatory tools to meet with community representatives uh, to identify what their health priorities are. We are then able to use the verbal autopsy data to illustrate the extent of that burden. So, for example, in the first cycle, a lack of clean, safe water was one of the priorities by identified. So we could use verbal autopsy data to illustrate how many um, children under five uh, mortality was probably related to um, unsafe water. Etc. So that's where we are able to bring that in because our health system only have data available pertaining to what happens in our facility and not outside of that. And from the demographic surveillance site, we have the information um, of full immuneration, in other words, the full population. In terms of challenges, I just want to maybe start at the, the participatory process um, where we are meeting with the community members um, and um, one would be facilitation. Um, we, we had really good um, sessions. Um, at the start, we, we had two problems identified. It was lack of clean, safe water and then alcohol and drug use. So in the alcohol and drug group, we had participants uh, that would sometimes be a little bit um, disruptive and had to be managed in the session. I think that was also valuable learning for us in terms of facilitation um, because the principles of participation is, um, you know, um, equal, equal power, um, and respect, um, consensus, etc. So that took some um, facilitation and learning. Uh, maybe also to reflect on being um, based at uh, HDSS, which is not 
really exposed to social science and the kind of work we do. And I don't really want to put that as a, a negative or as a, a challenge, but um, yeah, we were the, the salsa dancers at the cowboy line dance. So <laughs> probably to, to um, you know, make others understand what we're doing and, and how, because in our process, researchers are very much part of uh, the process, in not only as observers, but as a full, um, or, or as we would say, the, the community workers and our system um, stakeholders are all researchers in, in the participatory process. So that was quite something different. And then so Sophie, maybe just reflecting very briefly on something that I don't think we often talk about, and we definitely never publish. But we had, over the uh, last seven odd years, we had we have quite a small, um, close-knit group of our researchers and then the community that we work with. And we had a fairly high level or burden of um, personal trauma um, in our group. And as I say, I don't think that's something we ever mention, but not a single member of our research team have not been touched by something rather severe in their lives in the, over the last few years. And I do dare say, I think it's something that we need to maybe also sometimes acknowledge that that um, may not impact anything in terms of outputs and outcomes because you tr still try to do that, but we maybe need to also just acknowledge the human part of um, um, any stakeholder in the process. Uh, we lost a CHW, a community health worker, due to violence. Um, so the reality is out there. And I think if we do participatory work and we do collaborative work and you are in there, you are very much yourself a stakeholder and need to acknowledge that as well. Thank you very much, Maria. And um, yeah. I think just to add a reflection on that, when we started out, we very much were focused on community and service providers and the role of evidence, which I think is a bit more explicit than in the other projects we described. So just to kind of compare and contrast a bit there. Um, what we hadn't done, I think, at the initial stage was centralise the researchers. <laughs> so, you know, a, little, a year in, we realised we were part of the story. And actually changing mindsets in the research team has been quite challenging in itself. As Maria alluded, we're, we're in a center where trial data is the main approach and even convincing our colleagues that what we were doing was worth doing and worth investing in, which is absolutely key for sustaining it, has in itself been a challenge. So we've kind of put ourselves in the picture a lot more, which I think is, is really appropriate. So yeah, thank you very much. I'm gonna hope that Fernando can now speak to us. Fernando, speak. Hello, do you him? Yes, we can hear you. You're a little bit quiet, but we can adjust that here. Please go ahead. Tell us about your work, which is very community focused as well. So nicely complimentary, I think. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this panel. So I'm going to share a little bit about the work uh, we have done uh, in the Center for Studies about uh, uh, equity and governance in health system, sex. So, um, sex is a, 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 a research uh, institute, a technical institute that work with uh, community leaders trying to uh, promoting uh, accountability, promoting um, uh, advocacy in uh, public health services. So to understand a little bit about uh, the context and the challenges, um, I would like to to you put things like a, like a, the sound mode, you know, that they have to swim uh, against the currents to get to a point to put their uh, its eggs and, 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 and this stuff. So uh, in Guatemala, there are very strong currents uh, that uh, that are very difficult or or, uh, or consistent difficult challenges uh, to to exclude the indigenous communities to have a have a voice in 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 the definition of policy to have a voice in uh, in uh, the the priority setting of, of, of health, or even in, uh, to, to have a voice in general. So um, uh, what we do in sex is uh, we have uh, 
identify and, 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 and work with community leaders to have uh, different learning sites. Uh, we have uh, around, uh, we have worked around uh, 138 uh, community leaders in eight uh, different linguistic communities of uh, all indigenous uh, communities from Guatemala. So like many, uh, uh, many low middle income countries, uh, indigenous communities faces uh, different levels of exclusion, discrimination, lack of public services. Uh, in Guatemala, for example, the public investment in indigenous communities is half of what uh, government invests in non-indigenous communities. Uh, the poverty conditions are and, and, and inequality are concentrated in indigenous communities. And one of the, the, the most difficult challenges of thinking again in, in, in this idea of current that of, of current of forces is uh, the the current of history, you know, the, the history as a as a as a way to build a certain level of conformity in in, in citizens, in, in citizens, you know. Uh, one well, of the, 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 the first challenges we face is convincing people that we have, as citizens, the power to make a change. And the beginning, people don't believe it. People see like, uh, 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 it's like, uh, it's so many generations being in poverty condition, being exclusion, suffering from racism and discrimination. So at the beginning, it's difficult to believe that, uh, that uh, even some, something so simple like the idea of having rights and that the government is not doing you a favor just uh, with the low quality of public health services. Uh, and this is a reality uh, we face in, in many rural communities of Guatemala. You know, this idea that uh, government, uh, uh, city halls, or uh, public health services are doing, are doing a favor. Are doing something like uh, it's not their their obligation, their duty, based on a legal framework, based on the on the on the idea that people have a right, and because they have a right, they can claim quality, they can claim good attention, they can claim uh, uh, good stocking, and uh, and claim that the 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 offer the 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 service offer uh, match their health needs. So that's what one of the of the of the of the challenges we face when we start to 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 work with these uh, communities, and we uh, work as a as a as a mentorship process uh, in which we try to we attempt to 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 generate the conditions for learning for uh, learning in in practice and to discover uh, in the practice what means to be citizen, citizen, full citizen. Uh, and with this, uh, uh, be able to break historical uh, power inequalities, uh, historical patterns of racism and discrimination. So uh, this process of, of legal empowerment and, and mentorship is basically in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a basic model in which we have uh, uh, a basic uh, Introduction of ideas about the right to health and uh, and, and and citizens uh, cheap, uh, citizenship rights that are uh, that are in the legal framework of Guatemala. You know, Guatemala recognizes uh, health as a as a public body and as a right to health to all citizens. Uh, so based on that idea, we try to 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 start a process. Okay, so we understand we have rights. This is a right, and based on that, we have certain entitlements that we have as citizens. Uh, so our law in Guatemala uh, uh, says that uh, the health services have the obligation to facilitate um, community participation in. Uh, uh, in uh, monitoring, prioritizing, uh, uh, evaluating different different activities. So uh, we, with community leaders, we learn these principles, and then we go to public health services to fulfill or uh, or, or right 
you know, I think is go monitor health services, talk to patients, identify uh, what is the, the the quality of service that is being delivered to the population, see the conditions of the infrastructure, see a stock of medicine and medical equipment. And then uh, with all this information, we go uh, with the communities, leaders, make uh, an assembly and try to understand what are the the thing what we have been finding where or what is or evidence that we have identified and this in this in this process then we build our uh, report with the community leaders and with that report we go to uh, to health authorities to try to find that solution Fernando, to try to make hello yes? sorry to yes. jump in i'm just mindful of time um can you just highlight one or two no. challenges? Because I want to make sure we get some time to get comments from the audience. So just to... Hello. Hello? Oh, dear. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Ah. Can you just give us very briefly one or two challenges you're facing? And then I'm going to turn it to the audience. Okay, perfect. So uh, one of the main challenges are... Uh, historical conditions of inequality that shape an idea or shape certain assumptions in, in, in the population. Uh, the idea that we cannot change uh, reality as it, as, 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 as it is. Uh, other big challenge is uh, funding. Funding, sometimes uh, funding agency, uh, they want very linear uh, projects and processes and they are not. They are not. Sometimes they are not committed to long-term uh, commitments to build this kind of a long-term uh, process of building capacities in uh, in communities with the historical uh, history of of discrimination and exclusion to to build capacity to exercise their rights. Um, another uh, big uh, challenge is how to engage and generate uh, 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 um, leverage conditions to accountability in public health services. That is very difficult and many of our learning process has been building around that. What works, what don't work, what type of evidence work, what type of evidence don't work. Uh, and in, in Guatemala, this is very, very complex because Guatemala is a, a, a very fragmented, has a very fragmented health system. So what we have in terms of accountability are authorities that are like a, in a pinball, in a pinball table. You know, you everyone is just pushing uh, responsibility officials to, to the other, to the other, to the other. So by being this fragmented, so it's very difficult for, for, for communities to understand which problem uh, which is the authority responsible for each problem. Uh, and sometimes uh, people get frustrated because uh, the historical attitude of authorities is that lack of responsibility or, or uh, if people don't bring uh, the, 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 the right problem to them, they go up uh, in, the, in the meeting and say that it does not uh, anything to do with their job. So Fernando, I'm going to uh, cut in again. I'm going to okay. cut in. I think okay. you need a whole session to yourself. Um, so <laughs> I think that's coming on to what we have achieved, what we can achieve, and in what context. So in what context can these kind of approaches work, which is kind of round number two. So I just want to open it to the floor. Anybody who's got experiences to contribute, projects you've worked in, things that you think bring additional insights to the ones the panel's already shared, or any other questions or observations? Over to you. Sorry, can't see the whole room in one go. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for very interesting Presentations. My name is Yudhiti Chikolani. I work um, for Curation International Foundation in Georgia. We, have, we had a similar type of project, which was uh, uh, yeah, embedded research, but we worked at the national level, which was really challenging. And I wonder, uh, my first question, probably to those who worked on the uh, district health management level, 
Um, the research question uh, formulation process, I wonder how it went and what was your role, whether you as a researcher some kind have suggested any ideas even to the, to the research question, not the formulation because it's also a uh, researchers should have a role there, but a topic itself because you might have a, this understanding that that topic might require my, I mean, understanding and more in-depth investigation rather than the one which is, which I mean, managers uh, have uh, suggested, which is a more urgent topic. And also the uh, um, availability of their policy, so-called policy makers, right, or managers in there to be involved in the process. How it was, uh, whether the higher level might have lower time to be engaged and mid-level probably more. So I wonder how it went. work to establish those kind of relationships. Any other questions? I think if we, if we have two or three and then we can go back to the panel. Um, where's Sam? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question. Um, being establishing a learning site is about in business of the uh, or uh, co-production of knowledge between health managers and uh, health researchers. Uh, I know about performance scale, we faced um, many challenges with the decision space of health uh, managers. So I wonder if in other learning sites you have faced similar problem and how you overcome or ever overcame this problem. Thank you. We've been definitely been struggling with that issue in South Africa, haven't we? A lot of conversations around decision space and the challenges of lack of it in many systems. Just a question, um, uh, colleagues from Nairobi. You, you said that it's been eight years of your learning side, right? I was wondering, I mean, eight years learning in one site or learning in many sites, the scalability and the opportunity, what were the opportunity, if there were any, in terms of scaling up your learning beyond the learning sites? I mean, the question I ask because we have like never ending pilots um, pilots and some pilots, they, they die with the, with the pilot uh, or, or learning side within the certain boundary and hardly this learning actually goes. But the reality, the, the aim behind the learning side is to feed the various components of health systems um, that help strengthening in the long run. What, what has been your experience um, on that side? Were you? No, no, okay. I was misreading your body language. Okay, so I think let's take that back to the panel. So we've got a question about how you formulate your questions and your topics, I think. We've got a question about availability of counterparts, I suppose. Um, a question about managing decision space or lack of decision space in a system to respond to the learning that is being generated. And finally, I think Sushil's question is, scale versus depth sort of question. How, yeah, focusing in one area or expanding. Um, Jacinta, just, would you like to pick one or more of those? Uh, thanks, Sophie. So I think um, also just to allow my other panelists, I'll just speak to the last question. So um, I'm based in Nairobi, but our landing site was in Kilifi. And very happy that I've got two learning site members with me at the back so they can answer your questions. And I'll just nod along. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think um, when I started talking about how much we were able to do in the, in the learning site in Kilifi, um, you know, eight years of learning, and um, as much as we haven't been able um, to get the, funded, uh, the project refunded, uh, we saw this as, an opportunity, as a platform, really it cre created a platform for us to do so many other things. There's a wide variety of work that's happening within Kilifi that's not uh, related to the questions that we, we raised with the managers, but still working with the same managers to address those questions, whether these are clinical questions or other um, health-related questions. So I think it's the nature of the approach that we used with them in terms of the relationships we build, the understanding of what they're facing every day, and then just taking that up, uh, taking that into other, other, other uh, questions that we are trying to answer, other issues that they were facing. So that's 
uh, if you think about the learning site in a geographical, uh, uh, from a ge geographical point of view. But I think also the learning that we got from that learning site has definitely shaped the work that we do as a program in terms of our health policy and systems research, which often transcends not just within the subnational level with the county managers who are like your district managers, but also up the stream with our national uh, policy makers. So that has been useful in that regard and has definitely shaped our policy and community engagement uptake activities. Um, I don't know if this is chair's action or <laughs> my colleagues would want to add. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's a, an, a very interesting reflection, whether we are, in a way, like a health demographic surveillance site, are we using data from specific sites to shed light on a whole system? So I'm not sure if that manages the tension that Sushil was talking to, but... In the interest of time, I was thinking, Maria, would you like to talk about decision space since we have had quite a lot of conversations in the group about, do you want to pick up on that question? And maybe, Joe, I don't know, I'm just randomly allocating here, but this issue of choice of topics and maybe unavailability of counterparts, just to... Um, thank you so Hello. Um, just starting off with maybe a, a quick response on the um, availability of, of stakeholders as well. We initially um, thought that we are going to be engaging with district level, uh, provincial level planners. And then after our first cycle and through meeting with them um, and evaluating the process, we collectively came to an agreement that it will be... Um, at a district level, and then from that, actually at the sub-district sub level. So we are now working at sub-district level with the people who are so-called coal-facing. And that has, every time, been with a formal delegation to the next or the lower level um, to um, continue with uh, representing the higher level. So we are now working very directly with the sub-district, very um, approachable, available, um, and I think we've managed to build very good working relationships um, in terms of uh, the understanding of what the process is all about, as well as maybe the, the mutual learning and gains from the project. So by moving from a provincial focus to a sub-district local focus has made quite a bit of difference. So also then touching on the decision space, um, yeah, that's usually uh, quite a, a challenge depending on, uh, you know, all the different stakeholders. Uh, if we work with community health workers, for example, the majority or, or a significant proportion of the community health workers in the... A significant um, number of our community health workers have not been formally absorbed by the health system. So they, we have people working for five years and are not being paid, um, and others receiving stipends. So there's this disconnect. Um, so that's also been quite a sensitive topic. And then, of course, we work with the, the full structure um, operationally. So community health workers, they have their team leaders. They are attached to a clinic with a clinic operational manager. And that is basically where I would dare to say the, the collective decision space or power gets a little bit stronger because the community health worker on her own may be very limited. But what we've also gained in our process, maybe touching on, on what's coming up in the next part, is the the confidence of the community health workers that has increased along with their skills building and their capacity building. They are regarded um, now as... Um, true members of the team, where they used to really be bottom rank and not regarded by um, other health workers for the role that they could and should be playing, and how the relationship with their seniors, whether that is the, the outreach team leader or the operational manager, has really um, changed quite significantly, which, as I said, collectively they capacity to bring about change is stronger when they are within the team other than looking at each stakeholder um, individually. While it's working. Just to switch, but 
just to say that, yeah, I think one of the interesting things of APA is the working at multiple levels, as Maria alluded, and some of the levels were more frustrating than others for various reasons, which we don't have time to go into now. But, but, but one, of the, one of the challenges in many of these systems is the vertical communication. So not just peer-to-peer -peer learning, but also the ability to create spaces where people in a system can actually talk to one another up the chain and across the chain. And if we felt that was something we could contribute through this sort of safe space idea. And I imagine that's also the case in some of the other projects. So also interesting to get reflections on that. So, sorry, I'm back to the you with a mic. Okay, so I'm going to answer this question about the research question or topic. Um, basically, in Perform to Scale, we're working with country partners, research partners that are really embedded in the health system, know the policy makers very well. They've had long-term relationships with, with local policy makers and recognised with them that management strengthening at the district level is needed. Um, and I can give a particular example with Malawi where, where leadership at the district level was top on the, you know, high on the agenda with the Ministry of Health there. So this was kind of feeding into the, you know, the, that, that's, they weren't involved in the formulation of the research question, but in the topic they were involved in with that. And then I think another way of looking at, at it is at the district health management team level. You know, the action research approach allows people to pick the problems that they want to address. So the research question at that level was guided by them and what they did about it, you know, it was guided by them, the ownership of that problem. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, also adding on to Joe's, uh, we are in the very early phase of implementation, so um, I don't have very much uh, answers to your question, but we have just started our learning site work, and it's been a few months now, so we are in the process of formulating form forming the research question. So we have that wider area agreed with the municipalities, as Joe said, and now we are digging out the problems and the root causes for those problems. So we are doing it in a collaborative way. So um, the uh, stakeholders are there. We are also um, uh, in a separately um, meeting with communities, so we are also taking their voices. So uh, bringing everyone and then getting the problems from them, so uh, it, it, it is a more of collaborative way, and then we are involving them in the formulation of research questions. So yes, I think if I answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shapika. So I'm going to turn ooh, to Fernando now. <laughs> and um, maybe I can do two things, Fernando. Anything on the, from the questions you'd like to pick up on, but also just to ask you to launch our second round, which was questions to the panel around what do you feel you've achieved in your learning site? And obviously recognizing that these programs are all at different stages of maturity, if you like, but um, what do you feel have achieved? And, and trying to draw out some lessons from your experience on where and how learning sites can work. So in what sort of context can they be an effective approach and by implication, which ones potentially not? So over to you. So I think uh, one fundamental element especially uh, working with uh, a excluded uh, communities uh, is um, is a commitment in 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 bottom of uh, process of learning and listen 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 to people try to 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 find answer strategy solution fitted in the in the in the conditions of of communities and conditions of people and like uh one of our uh, of my colleagues uh, in the panel says facilitating facilitating conditions to learning and this is this could be could be a little bit difficult uh but with persistence and with uh uh humbleness uh, is it, you see that attitudes change, that synergies start to arise uh, with uh, sentences, with uh, authorities, uh, with uh, 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 with uh, city halls. Uh, you are able to see 
changes in conditions, changes in the in the in the possibilities to 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 make leverage for building accountability processes that uh, want to that, that impact in the in the quality of, of services. Uh, another thing that I think is important is see. It, it concerns a little bit redundant to see this as 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 process, not not linear projects, you know, but but iterative process of 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 learning, adaptation, and and from uh, NGOs, it could be very difficult. Uh, sometimes NGO uh, NGOs are just rushing in times of in the, in the times of projects. And we we'll, uh, sometimes we don't have the time to sit and reflect and learn from our mistake from our or trajectory. So I think that's very very important uh, to, to plan process of learning, to plan process for debriefing uh, with our partners, with uh, our benefic beneficiaries, and try to gain resilience uh, in the in the process of uh, uh, accountability. Uh, because uh, it's, 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 it's difficult in, 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 in context with political conditions change uh, and the windows of opportunity open and closes. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's, it's also important to, 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 to have tangible, tangible goals, you know, to so people can see uh, that all these efforts that they are doing are going are going somewhere, are going somewhere, and see the steps or milestone in the process to achieving the change that they want to they want to see. That's what, that is something uh, also also important. Um, I don't know. Sometimes our organization we tend to be very technical in our goals, technical in 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 our approaches to uh, for the problem solving, uh, but. It's important to 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 fit this in the realities of communities, you know, and people uh, build or, or or goals basically in the changes people want to see, people want to feel in the health services, uh, and from the that we have we have built priorities, agendas, and we have in this iterative uh, iterative process, but basically in, in the changes people want to feel and see and, and feel when they go to the health services to be treated nicely with, be treated with respect that the people, uh, can receive their medicine, can, uh, with sometimes a very basic, 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 basic stuff, but, uh, the challenge is how to, 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 to produce this element based in the conditions of reality of, 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 of communities to allow a process in which uh, the knowledge we can uh, generate as academics, as, a, as an activist, can fill an uh, activist process on the, on the, on the ground and in the field uh, to, to, to make, like, like you say, actable, actable knowledge, actable knowledge, and for that we really need to to listen uh, communities to to have a, a, a facilitating attitude and confidence to to build that kind of process hand to hand. Great, thank you very much, Fernando. So some of the tensions or challenges there, particularly the incredible difficulty of building the relationships in the first place and then this issue of tangible effects. We all want to get to the tangible effects, but even that middle level process is really challenging. Um, plus the reflection ourselves as researchers and coming back to Maria's point, the fact that it can be quite traumatic, the work. So we also have to consider how we process the experience of working with some of these very challenging communities. So I've noted a hand, I'll come back to you, Karina. I'm just gonna give the panel a quick chance to say, what works, in what conditions can it work? Any thinking about benefits from the process? Thank you, Sophie. So if we, if we regard maybe three main learning um, from VAPA, the first one being giving voice to the community. Um, the second one being connecting the community then with the service providers so that there's alignment there. 
And the third one being that this process should then be embedded within the health system for it to be sustainable. So gains or, or, or learning so far, um, very early on, I recall that we, uh, we also use photo voice as one of the tools. And I remember very well when we met with some of the provincial stakeholders and we had a picture uh, relating to um, infrastructure and the immediate response was, oh, no, that's not in our province, that's actually from Mozambique. Um, so for a provincial manager to not acknowledge the circumstances that people live in, they lived reality to be that of the community we are intended to serve. Um, so that also clearly um, illustrated you know, some degree of disconnect. So engagement has been a very big uh, positive for us, um, having people in the same room and being able to talk to one another, including stakeholders external to the health system. Um, then also the it's absolutely actually, I want to say the magic of seeing community health workers um, grow and blossom with confidence and actually standing up in our workshops and facilitating parts of the workshop, presenting to the seniors um, and the silence in the room from the seniors to witness the community health workers confidence and do that and that has actually resulted in in different role allocations um, community health workers that have been part of the program have different roles now in terms of them being acknowledged for their skills and not being regarded as an unskilled lower rank um, what i also want to reflect on is um, the role or the scale up from that. So we started off with just one group of about 12 community health workers and then um, in our third cycle um, take them through this uh, training on applying participatory um, methods um, in community mobilization and community engagement and then from the sub district we were requested to scale that up and we then trained a further 50 um, and then including outside of the surveillance site so um, it was first actually for the agent court site to have a research project that's not only working within their boundaries but we've been working in the full sub district all local areas um, so that was also I think very very valuable um, and uh, overall Embedding in the system, um, we are in two weeks' time formally launching our CHW platform that has been established through this process, um, connecting the CHWs with their um, lead in the, in the um, health system because there has never been a channel for them as a collective to communicate upwards into the health system and also for communication downwards to them. Um, so that's also, I think, a very positive outcome and uh, a way that we hope the process will also be sustained going forward. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Um, I think that creating that space for problem analysis, strategy development as a team, but also that learning across districts um, was really key. And those learning across districts, I'll tell you something that was quite funny really with these districts that came together and there's the national league table for districts. And the one district was quite high in the table and the other one was quite low, or the other two were quite low, and they were like always looking at that one. How did you get there? What What are you doing that's making you top of that league table? So it was, it was this sort of competition between the districts, which we we didn't really want, but it created that, and looking like learn trying to learn from each other to see what was happening there to to improve the performance of those districts. So that was one way, but but I think also that so. So in those sort of two ways, there was lots more sort of confidence and um, independence in problem solving and strategy development. So with people addressing problems that they would have said, I can't do anything about this. I want to defer it to the regional level or national level. So they were um, actually able to think, yeah, come on, let's, let's have a go as a team to work this one out. And then thinking creatively. So this was about that money, that we weren't giving any money for implementation funds. So, you know, in the, in the, in the 
position of having limited resources, we all have to be creative and innovative with what we've got, really. And I think that's what they were trying to do with that. And an example of that was with one district where they'd identified that they really wanted to do induction for health workers that were new into the district, but they got no money for it. Um, so they, they went um, to a local bank and said, come and pay for our induction workshops with all these staff, and we'll give you a little bit of space at that workshop to sell your, work, you know, sell your bank wares. Um, and, you know, it did, they did do that. Uh, I mean, I, anyway, <laughs> so that was thinking creatively. Um, yeah, teamwork. And also then um, improvements in workforce workforce performance and service delivery. So the overall aim of, of all of this, we were able to see some, some improvements in all of that. What was more tricky is that we could give a very strong narrative about that. And we could give some um, kind of quantitative data for that too, and which was supported a lot with that qualitative narrative. But when it came to kind of scale up, which is what Perform to Scale has been doing as well, scaling up that management strengthening intervention, um, is that the policymakers really wanted quantitative evidence. Come on, you know, the hard evidence of this. So it's really, I think, a key learning is to get that. You know, somehow we need both of those sets, lots of different methods to be able to provide that kind of evidence that is really supportive of scale up. I'll stop there. Thank you Yeah, thanks Sophie. So I think um, just thinking in terms of the gains, a lot of these things have been mentioned, but just to iterate about the importance of creating these safe spaces where people can meet and continue working on small wins and things that they can change within their own sphere of influence was very, very, very important. Uh, Joas talked about having more confidence in problem solving. So I think for, for Resist, that did come out very clearly that we had contributed to improving the capacities of both uh, of the managers within the system and their ability to be even more resilient as the system goes through dynamic changes. I think the other big thing that did come out as again um, and as a learning lesson for us was that leadership is absolutely essential within the system and looking at leadership, not just in formal positions, but looking at who is agitating for change, who is, who is becoming a natural voice for this, and then looking at how to support those and looking at leadership in a more distributed, team-based, collaborative manner. That, that was very useful in supporting the activities within the learning sites. And I think the last thing that I want to say is what is already happening in this room as a gain to us. I think when we started the learning sites work, this was a very early conversations around learning sites. And I continue seeing it as a process, as a process and not an end to a, mean, to a means. And I think the fact that we've got all these different consortia looking at it, then we are con continuing to contribute to the knowledge and the theoretical approach around that, which I think is a very useful gain and something that uh, we need to continue thinking about in terms of how do we strengthen the key messages that are coming out of this so that it's not just another lessons learned, but it's actually um, you know, something that can be sustained. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a long way for, for the rebuild team to go because we have just started. Um, uh, yes, I mean, in this early phase, I. Uh, I have I have few things to share uh, from Nepal. Uh, I think we have been able at least to uh, uh, build that uh, relationship, that uh, trust within the municipality stakeholders, and I think that is uh, one of the biggest achievements uh, so far. Because without that element of trust, it's not going to be um, um, effective uh, implementation in the municipality. And uh, and 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 uh, we we have and and the biggest learning here is that. Uh, um, uh, we are uh, engaging with municipalities, not only, uh, I mean, not only uh, narrowing down to our research work, but we are more engaged in wider municipality uh, activities, functions, and I think that has helped us to gain that uh, trust, and that strong, um, um, the trust within us and the trust with the research and the municipality team. So I'd like to highlight that part here. And, um, 
that has definitely created the respectful environment for us to work in the municipality. Uh, the second one uh, I want to highlight is about the uh, importance of uh, uh, evidence within the municipality stakeholders because uh, from the day one we have been um, we have been uh, lobbying about the use of evidence we have been whatever arguments we have been making in the municipalities are all based on the evidence we gen we use the locally generated evidence we uh, generated more evidence we analyze the policies and so everything is based on evidence and that is clearly evident to the municipality people and 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 they are i mean they have uh, frankly acknowledged and they have appreciated the fact and now they are speaking about the importance of evidence at the municipality level and so now they are uh, talking about establishing a portal where they will pull all the evidence that is that are locally available uh, in the municipality so that they can use that in the decision making so i think that is a real gain here uh, no matter the use of evidence is another story that we need to work with at least they have that realization of the importance of evidence here. And uh, another one, uh, another one is about uh, is 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 with the non uh, non health stakeholders because health has remained as a priority among the health system stakeholders ever since. But these non health stakeholders they think health very differently, and then they just think health as a building, hospital, drugs, uh, ambulance infrastructures like that. So uh, we uh, in Rebuild we have been doing this uh, group model building exercise where we talk about uh, the problems. Uh, identify the root causes, why, why is this happening, what needs to be done. So we are doing this series of workshops with different set of stakeholders. And one of the uh, GMB workshop <coughs> we did was with the uh, Excuse me, ward level, uh, ward level elected officials. So, uh, under the municipality, there are different wards, and each ward has uh, different sets of uh, elected officials who are the main decision makers, who make decisions for the ward, who use the resources. So, uh, with in in this particular work, so I'm just trying to give an example that. Um, we discussed about health, health issues, health priorities, health system, what needs to be done. So. At the end of the workshop, uh, what this uh, watcher said that this that was the first ever workshop where they sat and they discussed about health, health issues, health priorities, and I think that is in in a, in a way we sensitize them about what the issues are. They know the issues, but that are now backed up with evidence, and now they are more clear why things are not happening, and they and and we receive a kind of commitment from them that they are having. A meeting among themselves regularly, routinely, and now they are very clear that they are together. They are more stronger when they are together. So now they bring their issues together because they have common problems, common issues, and a common goal. So together, when they go and speak about their problems with the municipalities, there is a likely chance that it gets addressed quicker, or I mean, it gets more importance. So that is, I think, in a way, <coughs> another gain that I would like to highlight here. Uh, about uh, learnings, um, uh, I think we uh, discussed about um, um, managing achieve, uh, managing expectations. This is a huge challenge, and we have started facing that. So I think we need to be very clear that what we are planning from our research work, we need to deal very strategically. Um, if there are funds within our research project, then maybe we need, we can create a reserve fund. You use that for managing their expectation. But when we are resource constrained, then we need to deal it very strategically. That is one of the learning I would like to share. And the other one is, uh, I think uh, Maria spoke a bit about it, that uh, transferring skills, uh, we are there to um, strengthen the system, uh, support them. And while transferring the skills, we need to be very much clear that we don't create that dependency among them. Uh, we. Um, we are there to you know, we we should be focusing more on institutionalization of the learnings more on the capacity strengthening part rather than doing everything on our own so when they when we go back from the uh, from the system then there should not be any vacuum space and uh, um, uh, other is, I think, um, the clear documentation plan. That was one, one of my challenges because there is a huge, huge amount of uh, work going on in the municipality, and documentation is a big, big challenge. So we need to be very clear about how we are going to document it and how we are going to present our learning, where we are using it. So yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, when, 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 when I want you to talk about challenges, you won't. And now. 
Um, I think, actually, you're very modest about the fact the beginning of the process, and yet the things you highlight are really, really encouraging, for given where that's at. So demand, creating demand for evidence, of course, that's music to our ears as researchers, but that's already very significant. And I think this issue of, of getting different stakeholders to work together across sectors, I mean, throughout the conference, we've heard the challenges of that, haven't we? It's, it's really a big gain where you can make it work, and we've had a bit of a go at that in Vapor as well, but it's, it's, it's not easy, but it's really important. And finally, that issue of um, creating trust and making yourself useful, which I think is really important. We all have to both serve our own sort of research interests, but we also need to be people who stakeholders at district level and, and in other parts of the system see as a real resource, and I think that's part of your success as a team in HERD. Karina, over to you for question. first question from the floor. Um, we've only got two minutes, so I'll try to keep it really brief. But I, um, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about um, our own situation. So I've recently moved to ITM, at the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, where a number of projects are not research projects, okay? They're implementation, health system strengthening in the context of the Belgian Development Corporation grants, right? So there is an attempt to think about learning sites as an approach, but this is a completely different context than when you're looking at Kilifi or you know any other Welcome Trust site or for that matter, any of Agincourt or any of the other DSS sites. So my question is, what is the learning curve? What is, I mean, those sites where people are more familiar with the terminology of what it means to be a research subject, what it means to be a participant, what evidence is and how evidence feeds into into policy and practice, we're looking at a completely different, not ground zero, but certainly a different starting point. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what your comment on that would be. So there is no history of 40 or 50 or 60 years of welcome trust here. We're starting from, you know, and, and we want to learn, but also understand what, what, is, con what is conducive to setting those up in, a, in, a, in Mauritania or in, in, in Mali for that matter. Back. Apologies, we've run late, a bit late, but um, there's a, an awful lot in this topic. And my question may just complicate things a bit more, so feel free to skip over it. Um, as I hear everyone having their final remarks, I'm noticing that maybe my question is a little complicated, but I just wanted to understand how policy comes into play and the lessons learned, um, especially at the local level, and knowing that um, it's with policy that funding can become available for these um, places beyond the project life. Um, what is the project doing to ensure that the policy narrative is a part of this discussion? And then, of course, there's the M&E component that I also was curious about, but we may not have time to talk about it, but if briefly you can, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to have to have a panel at the next session about following the story and how we track um, impact. I'm just wondering whether Sushil wanted to answer a question about policy, because that's quite a, a difficult... Quite a difficult one. I mean, we have experienced um, um, road to policy making, uh, policy influence, I would say, through these learning side arrangements. Tremendous success, I would say, um, when you have a very clear channel of policy communication and the learning communication from the local or district health systems up to the provincial and the federal level. However, this is, the road is not very clear cut all the time. Uh, what, what is our experience is, um, when you talk at the local level, influencing the local policy, we initially we use the national data presented, you know, this is what the national figures and the national process least bothered, they were not interested at all, simply they closed their eyes, oh, I don't bother about the national data. When we started talking about their own data, one data unfolding the reality behind the data, what it depicts, in a very simple language we used that, okay, what does it mean? I mean, it's their questions, they were answering the questions, but we were just facilitating the process to having this local um, simple description of and that attracted the policy makers at the local level. And they started contributing more funding to the health sector. And their municipality increased the funding. And the learning, actually the proof of concept, was rolled out 
That, that is one of the technical assistance support uh, under the FCDO funding to the Ministry of Health, what we learned quite a lot in terms of scaling up and hitting to the higher level policy. But I, I, I acknowledge the complexity behind this. But, but the simple message, what I can say here is getting the local data, describing in their own language, using for them, and facilitating rather than answering their question, just facilitating to answer their questions on their own way, and then creating a policy communication channel, the learning channel, and that helps to address the policy influence. Thank you very much, Sushil. So I'm just going to give, maybe in response to Karina's question, the mic to Sassy. I'm sort of diversifying answers here, so I apologize to the panel. I'm sure you're not upset I'm not giving you this question. They look happy. Grr. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's a really good point, Karina. And I guess, um, so your question was, how do you set these things up if you don't have the equivalent of Wellcome Trust funding and kind of support for decades? Um, my understanding from the different kind of presentations I've heard is that these learning sites have all been established differently in different places. And it's just getting back down to the, some of the basic principles and seeing what's feasible and possible to do in other places. And I think some of those basic principles, if I heard it right, are things like trying to set up a trusting relationship, being present on the ground, being present on the ground in the long term, being able to slowly respond and build up relationships and a mutual understanding about what is and isn't achievable. So there's no, I don't think there's a really kind of solid answer to that. Um, the relationships weren't in place at the beginning of the Wellcome Trust um, establishment or in Cape Town or in Vitz or in other places where there were long, where there's been these learning sites, but they were slowly built over time and very much orientated around the local context and people who were there and resources that were available. Thanks, Assi. Yeah, I mean, just to add on that, we've <laughs> always taken the approach that what you can do in fragile straits can sometimes be very creative. Um, because, you know, the, the, the resources are there in different form and the need is there. And um, so I don't think it's impossible. I think the learning site methodology, my personal take is the learning site methodology is equally possible in these different contexts. But clearly what we've outlined is quite a lot of stamina, problem solving, iteration, you know, making mistakes, keeping going, being resilient at both individual and system and organization level. Um, and on that note, I think we need to wrap. I'd really like to th thank the fantastic panel for presenting all of their experiences with, you know, honesty and, and kind of reflectiveness. And I feel, I'd be interested to hear what people think, but I feel there's, there is scope for trying to pull some of these lessons across. So building a bit that literature and that reflection and anybody in the room who's interested in contributing, feel free to come and talk to me afterwards. I think we might like, just look at, we can have a discussion. But clearly we didn't exhaust it today. Thank you so much for joining remotely, Fernando. We really appreciate it. And thanks for all the audience for their contributions. And wish you a happy end of conference. <laughs> <laughs>